Joe. Let's call this meeting to order. It is uh, 7 o'clock. It's the uh, special board meeting of the Board of Directors on Wednesday, July the 10th to uh, just, uh, review the, the budget proposals. And roll call, I see that we have everybody here except the new chair of uh, NE who is unable to attend tonight. Uh, adoption of the agenda. Uh, without any further discussion, I will uh, say that they, the agenda has been approved by acclamation. So moving on to continuing business, um, I think that Eric might have a motion to make at this time. I would like to move that we enter a modified uh, Committee of the Whole uh, type of session so that we can eliminate the rule of, uh, of only offering two questions each. Okay. And Second. also so that we don't have to make a motion before we have any discussion on anything. And, and there yep. will be no voting. Second. All those in favor? Approved. Okay. Moving forward to the business and voting is necessary, the draft budget presentations by department. Carol? I just wanted to make a comment because this is uh, part two of uh, a session. Obviously, the Finance Committee went through a similar process uh, uh, going through two meetings with all of the department managers and then having a follow-up <coughs> meeting to discuss it and to come with a recommendation, which you see before us today. And there are a couple of things I just wanted to mention that the Finance Committee asked me to advise the board of. Um, one is that, um, First of all, they believe, and we use as our background and our sort of guiding principle for making decisions about the budget, the vision, and the mission statement, and ask that the board also do the same. I don't have copies of that tonight. Hopefully you all remember enough about it, that, uh, but keep it in mind that you know, it's our responsibility to make sure we take good care of our, our facilities and for, of our community as a whole. Uh, the second thing is that this particular budget um, does not adequately, in their mind, fund the, what's facing us in the future. Um, this is a beginning, but part of the challenge that the Finance Committee had was to try to determine what will it take for us to move forward. They cannot make those kinds of decisions without direction from the board as to what a long-term plan is for our, or our, our community. We as a board, they ask, should immediately begin to put together a long-term plan about what assets we will keep, what assets we will get rid of so that the finance committee can actually put together a rational plan that will meet those objectives. So, um, and I think Leslie was at that meeting and she said that that would be something that we would address almost immediately. So thank you for that. The only other thing I wanted to mention, and I know it'll probably come up in the um, discussion tonight, but there was a, a tiny little amount of money going into the mailbox fund uh, of 23 cents. And it was pretty exciting because it was really the only asset we own that was being fully funded. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but it was a decision of the finance committee that that 23 cents could be better spent by um, moving it into SURF for this year. So that moved the amount of monies that will be in the dues for SURF uh, up by 23 cents. So uh, just keep that in mind. If you disagree with that, obviously you have the right as a board to change it. But I just wanted you to be aware that was such a tiny change that I wasn't sure everybody would have caught it. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, and the only other comment that I have yeah. is uh, we are looking at a budget for 2020, for next year. This is uh, not a discussion of what's coming up 10 years, three years down the road. Tonight's discussion has to do with next year's budget only. Mike? Uh, is everyone that is, wants to speak going to still raise their hand and be uh, addressed? Okay. okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, who's starting off? Carol, Joe? Yes, okay. please. Uh, actually, this is going to be Joe and uh, Jennifer's um, show <laughs> and the managers. And so I'll let Joe direct because he has uh, the order in which people will be and then Jennifer will assist us. Uh, as happened at the finance committee meeting, Jennifer has many, many spreadsheets with much information and she will do her best to answer any questions or provide any details you can, she can. Um, uh, it just depends on how um, 
how aware she has been made of the kinds of questions she'll have. So um, she'll let us know if she has that information or not. Thank you, Jennifer. Appreciate you. Good evening, board. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, present to you the 2020 budget with all of our managers. Uh, the order tonight will go golf, turf care, maintenance, facilities, marina, and surf. Uh, in the finance committee, we made it all the way through marina and we moved surf to the following night. Um, I would have assumed that all the board members have taken time to review their packages. And if they had any questions, they could have sent them to us. But uh, it's been out there. The man managers have put a lot of time into it. So uh, at this time, I will call Brian up to start golf. What page is this on so that we can look uh, at? 21, 21, 21. 21 is 21. golf management. Okay, page 21. Um, can I mention one other thing? Yeah. Um, it, I thought it was interesting. One thing that we brought out in the finance committee was that um, each $1,000 of item in, a, in the budget um, represents three cents per month per owner, approximately. So as we're going through this, we could keep this in mind. It's just uh, an interesting piece of fact, I think, that we should be aware of. Okay. Did you have anything else, Paul? No. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, first section in the golf budget is the revenue section. Um, and we've been very pleased with the um, direction the revenue's been heading in the last couple of years. Um, in 2018, we had record revenue of 797,000. Um, so we budgeted this year kind of a conservative number, knowing that the weather was really good last year, and so we are, we budgeted 785 for this year. Through the first several months, we were tracking really strong at about 10 percent um, above uh, 2018. Uh, so. Midstream, we kind of revised our projection for this year up to 824,000. Um, and our first run of the budget uh, back in early May, we uh, thought that, I thought that we'd be able to increase even over that for 2020, and I had budgeted at about 700, or sorry, 849,000 on my first draft. Um, not too long ago before this meeting through June, uh, we were performing still very strong, and uh, um, I felt confident in, re in revi revising the budget for 2020 up to um, 877000 So um, that I, I believe, based on some changes we've made, um, attracting more outings, um, still showing really strong growth in membership. In 2018, we focused heavily on membership, um, ran a couple promotions, and uh, we're, we're able to see significant growth in the membership. Um, so uh, we're kind of projecting that that growth will continue um, and that the uh, daily play, that, that the positive signs we're seeing on the daily pay, play will continue as well. So we are, um, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty aggressive number, uh, but I, I do believe we'll be able to, to, to do it. Of course, the challenge with golf is weather. Um, so it's kind of assuming that we'll get decent weather. Uh, <laughs> which the way the last two weeks looked, it just doesn't exactly feel like July. So, but, uh, so that's, kind of the, that's kind of the revenue picture. It, it's a positive one. Um, moving down to expenses, uh, some of our, you know, our, our, our biggest expense in golf and in turf care um, is labor. Um, so the big, big challenge we face it has been in a very aggressive um, escalation of the uh, minimum wage. A lot of our employees in golf and turf care are at or just barely above minimum wage. So with this, with this rapid um, increase in minimum wage, uh, we've been challenged, even though our revenue has been growing, um, our expenses have been growing and slightly outpacing our growth. 
And then next year, of course, we have, uh, we go from $12 to 1350 an hour. So a huge jump. But fortunately, the last of the significantly, uh, the, the significant mandated jumps. So we expect, I, just, I believe, more uh, cost of living type exp uh, uh, increases going forward. So um, we are kind of bracing ourselves for, an, for an, another big bump. And unfortunately, it's not just the minimum wage um, employees that are affected, but also the employees that are at or near minimum wage because we experience wage compression. So we, have, we, we feel compelled um, in, in order to keep our employees to bump those that are, that are just in the, in, the, in the, not too far from minimum wage, we feel compelled to bump them up as well, get them away from minimum wage. So, so that's that kind of the, the challenge that we're facing um, on the, on the um, salaries line. And we're, so we're gonna see a significant bump there. Um, other, other increases, um, equipment, R&M, um, we are operating a, a fleet of golf carts that, uh, the, the, the general story with the golf carts is quite positive. Um, our lease, our capital lease, um, with the, we have payments for those carts of about $35,000 a year, I believe. Um, and we, that le it was a five-year lease and it ended in May of this year. Um, we have, um, through our staff in golf and the staff, uh, the turf care staff, Jacob's staff, uh, done a, uh, quite a good job of maintaining the golf carts, so we feel comfortable um, operating them for another two years, uh, so with no, with no payment, so we'll be able to, to we, we fully own the carts now. We had, we had a capital lease with a dollar buyout, so we fully own the carts now. We'll be able to operate them um, for the next two years, saving $70,000 less the $20,000 um, refurbishment um, um, capital project that we were able to, to secure last fall. So we are going to sink $20,000 of capital money into refur refurbishing them and, and making them so they will last another two years. So the net savings uh, will be about $50,000 uh, by operating these golf carts for the next, next two years. Um, so other... So, so I, I kind of got off track a little bit, but, but our equipment R&M will be up significantly this year because we, with, the, with carts being five years old, we are, um, e even though we, had, we, we did do a significant refurbishment, we obviously didn't repair parts on all 50 carts. We ordered a lot of parts that we thought were, that we expected to, that we would have a high failure rate, but we can't predict exactly. So um, we still will have um, operational expenses on that R&M uh, line item that would be higher than in years past with the aging golf carts. So that's why that, that's why that number is, is higher. Um, let's see, other than that, that that's, those are pretty much our, our, our big jumps in, um, in expenditures. Uh, so with uh, the bottom line for golf with, with, the, um, with golf and turf care combined, um, we will end up, we'll end up looking at about a $74,000 deficit for the golf department next year. So that's, that's, what, we're, that's what we're expecting. Um, question. Uh, it looks like next year we are predicting a golf cart rental income at $127,000, how much are we going to be spending on golf carts? Well, we will be spending, we expect, to, I believe it was about $2,000 in, in R&M, and then we, I mean, if you look at all the operational expenses, you have, I mean, you have labor expenses in there that, you, that we don't really can't quantify those necessarily and separate them out as part of our staffing dollars. So we spend money to clean them, we spend money to repair them, right. um, but we will have no further capital. And those are basically operations? It's, it'll be operational, no further capital expenses beyond the capital refurbishment. Fuel. And okay. fuel, yes, fuel of, of course as well, yeah. Okay. And my other question on the uh, salary line, you're looking at 238, 380 on that. How many people does that uh, pay? So, uh, um, in terms of bodies, we have quite a few bodies in golf. We have uh, uh, we have 16 bodies, but they make up uh, 5.7 FTEs. Okay, and these are the people who operate the pro shop day to day from six in the morning till Correct. eight at Dawn, night or Dawn whatever. To, Dawn to dusk. Pick up and clean everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Correct. Other questions, Sarah? Hi. Hey. Um, Okay, a couple questions for you. Um, 
You talked about we projected revenues up kind of based on trending really well this year, and then we've been trending really good the last couple years, so we increased our projection a little bit. How much do you think you can influence? Obviously, it's so weather dependent. Is there a lot of room in your budget? Obviously, salaries are the big item. Can you reduce the number of people? Like if revenues, you know, if we have really bad weather next year, let's say, is there a lot of wiggle room for you to adjust expenses accordingly or not really worth the minimum? Or the, how no, do you feel about the, that? There is, and that's a, that's a good question. I think that this chart actually shows it quite well. I think if you go to, um, if you go to 2016, you'll see a dip, you'll see a dip in revenue. And that was a bad year of weather. And now if we can scroll down to salaries for that year, um, you'll see a dip there as well. And so, so what we, we do, I mean, when the weather's bad, we send people home. Um, so so the, if you know, we can even, and it even affects our scheduling. I mean, day of stuff, it means that's sending people home. Um, but if we have a week of bad weather scheduled, we will not staff up to the levels. Uh, so, so in the off season and shoulder seasons, not as much because that's, that's a lot of salaried staff there but a lot of our dollars are seasonal dollars. And so we do, we do have, you know, in effect are somewhat nimble and have the ability to scale down when revenues. It's always gonna be better for if the sun, if the weather's good, the revenue's good and the money's coming out, I'd rather have the staff there, but we will not, we, we will, we, we do have the ability to scale down when, when the weather's bad, yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, for the wage compression issue, I'm just wondering, did you guys have a cutoff for like anything $20 and below we adjusted wage compression or how, was there a cutoff or I guess was it by type of position or how did we decide where to stop with wage compression? So for, for us, for our seasonal staff especially, nobody even comes close to that level. So they're, they're all, I, I, think, I think I have 45, 4,600 hours of my 11, Hundred hours that are at, at minimum wage, okay. and then I've got another 3,500 hours that are that will be well that would be 50% below the new minimum wage. So that's a pretty good portion. That's seven. That's almost 8,000 of my 11,000 hours okay. that, that are in that in that range, it, right, right around minimum wage, and and unfortunately even below the new minimum wage. So. So the golf carts, the two years would be looking at a replacement in 2021 then, or 2022? To have um, to so, so we will, um, our game plan right now, assuming things go according to plan, would be to enter into a new lease in 2021. Okay. Yeah, so 2019, the se 2019 season, 2020 season, we'll be able to operate them without any capital expense. Okay. okay. And then... Based on kind of what you're doing and the changes you're making um, with marketing and the tournaments and getting new members in, what would your projection be for what year we could potentially break even, assuming this trend kind of continued? Um, that's a good question. I can't say that I've actually gone to, to a, you know, a three, four, five year projection to see. I do, um, so I wouldn't want to pin myself down to a year on that, but I think if, I think if we continue on the trend we are, there's a couple things that we're doing on the revenue side that are that are positive. Um, the focus on, rev, on on membership and groups; those two of our three revenue streams are less weather dependent. So, uh, one of the beautiful things about outing golf outings is they pretty much show up and play and pay regardless. So, um, they're an insurance policy. Uh, same thing with memberships. Um, if we, membership is virtually weatherproof, um, so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get that that revenue regardless. And and outings are the same. So the most volatile um, of our three revenue streams is daily play. So um, the fact that we are um, hopefully having less um, placing less reliance on the daily play should be a, should be positive long term for our revenue outlook. Okay. And then one last thing, the headcount 16, 5.7 FT, does that include turf care or is that just golf? No, that's just golf. Yeah, Thank just you. golf. Okay. Um, Madam President, Andrew. Andrew. Um, hey, can I just, on the, on page 14, I know we're not looking at that right now, but it's just a summary of on the operational side, it looks like there's a 16% de decrease in operations for golf and turf care. Can you help me unpack that a little bit? 16% decrease? Golf Enterprise. 19 budget to 2020. 2020 proposed budget. There's a, on the operation side, a 16.3% change. Down. Um, oh 
Boy, that, I, my understanding is that operational expenses have gone up. Is that not correct? But you had a 12% jump in incomes right here. Oh, so that's, so, that's mm -hmm. the net golf. Oh, that that's oh, so so that's that's the um, I'm sorry. I'm, uh, so that's the def so the deficit is going down by 16%, getting better. And that's based on revenue, revenue going up. <laughs> Another question, um, did we raise the uh, membership fees this year? In 2019, we had a significant increase of 12 to 15 percent on the um, membership rates, yes. Okay. Anything else? Sarah. Um, do we have any future projections for rate increases for memberships or? Do we have a schedule for that, or is it just based yeah, on performance? Typically, we look at it in the fall, and that will have to do, you know, a lot of our stuff is done based on a calendar year. So typically in the fall, when I look at rates for next year, I'll look at what kind of demand levels we had, um, what other courses are doing, what our competitors are doing. So let's look at several factors. But typically, we have the, the, the trend for the last several years has been 3 to 8% increases. Um, Last year, with the you know with the success that we had, with the the fact that m more and more people who are coming to Sudden Valley are coming here because of the golf course, we're seeing we're seeing that being a trend. Um, so we felt comfortable in making a significant increase this year. We pro my expectation is that our increase will be uh, lower than it was this year. So my if uh, right now I would kind of project a three to five percent increase for 2000. 20, but I've, that's not been said at this point. So when you did your revenue budget, what what were you basing it on? I guess it was, it was, ba it, it was based on 2019 rates. Okay. Did you get, um, since it was a much bigger increase in rates this year, was there a lot of negative feedback from that or how did that go over? Yeah, so it's, it's always, a, raising rates is always a challenge because you, you know, you're trying, obviously, you're, you're worried about losing um, people. We did not get much pushback. The, the golf members in general um, understand the pressure that we were under to reduce the deficit. Um, so they are very supportive. Um, we, you know, we even started a program in 2019 um, called the Membership Upgrade Program, where members could voluntarily pay a higher rate. They got some additional benefits that didn't cost Sudden Valley anything, um, and we were able to raise some. We were able to raise, I think, about in 2018, about twenty thousand um, dollars. For the most part, members who are able and were willing to to spend a little bit more for their membership um, to support the golf program. This year, we didn't see, while the program was still running, it hasn't been, um, we haven't had as many people participate because of the significant rate increase. How do our rates compare to our competition? Competitors? Rate? We are, we're right in line with our competitors. We're well, say, Bellingham Country Club, which is a private club, we would be well below them. Um, we would be considerably above uh, a Lake Padden golf course, the other the people that are more, that are similar to us, North Bellingham, Shucks and Avalon, those courses, we are right in line with them. And then youth membership, I know, I think it was last year during the budget process, we talked about, you know, trying to emphasize and bring in to go up. Yeah, so our, our um, junior memberships have not gone up. We have seen increase in our young family membership, which um, it kind of makes sense why we the young family, the young family membership that we in introduced in 2017, I believe, um, allows a family with children under 15, any, any, if they have any children in the household under 15, the whole family can get a membership for $1,100 for the year. So we have seen growth there, mm -hmm. and that some of the, that takes care of sometimes two, three, four juniors in that one household. So while our individual junior membership category has not shown growth, we have seen growth in the young family membership. Thank you. Well. Just on the subject of marketing, since it's mm -hmm. up there, um, <clears throat> given the 
um, popularity of golf um, or the, the increase or decline in popularity. Um, I don't know that much about it, so I'm going to um, leave that to you. Um, and the number of courses in the area. Um, where do you see market saturation with our continued growth? I mean, we've had we've seen a lot of growth in this right now. Mm -hmm. Where are we going to saturate on that? And um, if you could just kind of speak to how that's played into your yeah. calculations. Yeah. So um, I feel very confident in the direction and the the prospect for the Sudden Valley going forward, mainly because we the only golf community in Bellingham. So. The projections for growth in Bellingham are strong. Um, everything I read expects Bellingham to continue to grow for the next several years at a fairly rapid pace. So being the only golf community in, in Bellingham, I think, puts, you know, stands us in very good stead. Um, there are a lot of people who, like, who want, to live, want to golf where they live. So that, that, that prospect, and we're seeing it anecdotally. I don't necessarily have stats on new owners who are golfers, but certainly anecdotally over the last few years, we are seeing that more and more people that are, um, that are moving here, one of the reasons that they're moving here is because of the golf course. We talked about it at that finance committee meeting, but two years ago we instituted a, a program where we allow um, new homeowners to purchase their first year of membership at 50% at off. And we've seen significant um, each year. Our, our numbers are higher, are, are greater and greater on taking advantage of that promotion. Do you have any numbers on how many um, of those members retain memberships after that? Um, after that, um, the trial decrease? year decrease. Yeah. So it's uh, it got a little confusing because last year I did I ran another promotion that was aimed at current owners who had either no membership or a lower level of membership. They, uh, they were able to buy uh, their first year at half off, their second year at 25% off. Um, we saw of that promotion, we've seen about 45 to 50% renewal rate um, at that one. The, I, don't have, um, uh, my, I don't have stats on the new owner um, promotion, but I, but I would say I, I could certainly get exact stats, but I would, I would guess that, they rate, that those ones are um, renewing at a higher rate, I would think in the 60 to 75 percent rate. Okay. Thanks. Larry? Speaking of golf members, uh, about how many hours do they devote to doing volunteer work and about how much money are you avoiding or saving as a result of that volunteer work? Yeah, so, so um, about 1,100 hours a year uh, in volunteer work that um, our members, and some non-members too, there, there, um, there are non-golf and community members that contribute as well at, at a much lower rate, but, but they do. Actually, there are non-golfers who, who come and volunteer. It's, it's, been, it's incredibly helpful for projects. So if we have a project, um, uh, you know, replacing some boards on a bridge, um, redoing a bunker, um, doing some, some, and, and some, some of it would be considered maintenance. We, we, get a, um, we, have, we have a volunteer, uh, a member named Chuck Luttrell, who coordinates these volunteer efforts, and um, he does a big spring cleanup around the, around the clubhouse area. So to quantify how much money that saves us, uh, some of it we wouldn't do. So I can't say that it's 1,000 hours at $20 an hour, so it's 20,000. I, I can't say that because some of the, some of the stuff we wouldn't. We, we simply wouldn't do, but um, it's certainly, certainly uh, incredibly valuable. The, they also donate money. We have a course beautification fund um, that we raise money for every year. We raise three to five thousand dollars a year um, in course beautification, and, those, and that those funds, the golf club um, decides where they want to put that money. The the bank uh, where, where the retaining wall was built by the 18th um, green this year. The, that bank was all funded, the, all the landscaping was funded through the course beautification, new tee boxes on the golf course funded that way. So um, it's, 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 uh, it's really cool how, how committed and, um, and devoted to the golf course our members are, both with, uh, both with their time and their pocketbooks. Well, as a follow-up to that, given that you're saying that some things would not have been done, but have been done, are you seeing any kind of uh, 
impact on business by the fact that things are being done that actually Sudden Valley would not have been able to afford on its own. Yeah, I mean, that, that all goes to image. And if you believe that image is important, um, then, then undoubtedly. Our, our image uh, in the golf community has changed dramatically over the last three to five years um, uh, to where we are now considered one of, one of the absolute premier courses in the region. We always have been with respect to the setting. The setting of this golf course is uh, unmatched, really, in the region. And, uh, but we fell short in other areas in terms of, you know, golf, golf course maintenance, how, you know, how, how, the, how well the course was maintained. Jacob's efforts over the last eight years have, uh, have been remarkable in terms of uh, how he's helped change our image and, and, and certainly change the trajectory of the golf course, for sure. Carol? I know you have uh, <clears throat> spent this last year focused mostly on generating new revenue through tournaments mm -hmm. and outings. So can you tell us a little bit about your successes there and how um, confident you are that those will continue? Also speak to what's our saturation point before we start to have complaints from members that there are not, not, not enough days for them to play golf. Yeah, yeah, so um, pretty remarkable success uh, so far. We um, now, uh, we have over 37 groups booked. Um, we have projected about $103,000 in outing revenue. Last year we did $55,000. Um, so uh, now we oftentimes groups book a little bit on the high side. So even though right now we're projected at, at 100 and, 103, I would say that number most likely will end up more in the mid, mid 90s probably because typically with groups book for 100 and they show up with eight, you know, the two weeks out they kind of scale down to 80. So the, I wouldn't, you know, I, would, I wouldn't say, hey, we're gonna have, we're gonna, we're gonna definitely do 103,000 this year. I would say it's probably gonna be in the, in the mid 90s somewhere, but, but regardless, significant growth, significant growth in terms of the number of events and the number of players. Um, we were able to host, uh, we were asked to host the Washington State Women's Amateur Tournament this year. We were asked to host the United States Senior U.S. Open qualifying this year, which are, um, you know, events that certainly seven, eight years ago we would not have been in the running to host. So um, that's really positive that we're using that um, in our marketing, that, you know, the headline, uh, we're, that's kind of become our tagline on our website, on our scorecards. So we'll, and we'll be able to use that for years to come. Uh, so that those are those those type of, of outings are, are extremely helpful, not necess not necessarily in the, the revenue on the day of U.S. Open qualifying. We didn't receive any revenue for it was a Tuesday in May. So the, the hard cost to us was very low. Um, but the, the the benefit for us, because the golf course is in such amazing condition, um, the, the benefit for us in terms of the word of mouth from that day and then the ability for us to use that in marketing, um, to have hosting a level of uh, that prestigious will, will certainly serve us for many years to come uh, on the marketing front. Um, so the second part of that was the saturation um, oh, uh, with the members. Could you follow yeah, up with that? I can. Um, we, uh, again, uh, we're not, we are at 25 to 26,000 rounds of golf. Um, we're not, a, 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 con would not be considered a high volume golf course. So we have the, the amount of, we're probably adding about, um, this year we're going to add about a thousand outing rounds. So nothing at this point. We're not near the saturation point yet. It's certainly, a, certainly a possibility. Um, one of the great things we have with uh, we have an arrangement with uh, other private clubs in the area with Bellingham Country Club, Skagit Country Club, and Woodby Golf and Country Club. When any of those um, four courses have a have an outing that closes the course. We have the ability to get some reciprocal play. So we, so next week we've got our ladies' invitational on Tuesday and Wednesday. Reduces access, almost eliminates access for to the for the members of the golf course. So we are able to secure tee times at the other courses that our members can go then go play there on a complimentary basis. So uh, and and obviously it happens 
our, our way too, uh, that other courses use us when they have similar events, but it's a really good arrangement. It certainly helps buffer the, the concern over saturation. Sure. One other question. Um, if the board were to come back and say golf has to budget to break even for 2020, what would you cut? Well, I think that would be really, it would be difficult um, to, without affecting revenue, you might be able to do it year one. Um, you'd, it would have to be in salaries, that's our that's that's you know by far our largest item. So we would have to reduce the amount of staff, reduce the levels of service. Could you get away with it in year one? Possibly. Um, we saw it in 2013 when we operated the golf course with with uh, no food and beverage. We our revenue numbers that year were were not bad, um, but we we made a lot of our customers really angry. We PO'd a lot of people. And so 2014, we paid the price. So um, even though we had food and beverage in 2014, we scared a lot of people away. So next year, could we reduce our levels of service and reduce our golf course conditioning dramatically and maybe get away with it, maybe get to break even? Possible. Um, but word of, mouth, word of mouth is powerful and it spreads fast in golf and uh, uh, it, would be, it would be really hard to recover. It took us a while to recover from 2013. I mean, you, when you work hard to get customers back, we, our golf course in the 2007 to 2010, 11 period had fallen into pretty poor conditions and our reputation, I was not working here at the time, I saw it as a competitor. And I, I watched Sudden Valley kind of cease to be a competitor in the golf, in the local golf industry, local golf economy. And it took us a while. I mean, Jake got here in 2011 and he almost immediately turned things around. The membership saw it immediately, but to get back the daily play and the outing play, it takes time. And, uh, and it's it, it, thanks to these several years of effort, thanks to the support of the community and the board and allowing us to you know, to, to get the capital equipment that we need, to have the operational budget that we need to, to improve the product, we're seeing the fruits of it. If we choose to go backwards, it will be exponentially more difficult to get these, to get customers back. Okay. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, next will be uh, Turf Care with Jacob. And what page are we on there? Yeah. 41. Page, page 41. 41. Good evening, all. <clears throat> so, to start out, Turf Care is the golf course uh, maintenance side of the golf enterprise. Uh, budget for 2020, um, just some highlights. Um, obviously a huge increase um, on the uh, salaries and wages um, compared to previous years due to um, statute increasing the uh, minimum wage, uh, about 70% of our work hours in the year are within a dollar of minimum wage or at or with, within a dollar of minimum wage uh, for 2020, so uh, it, in almost all cases those those just get automatically increased or uh, there's a uh, hope to uh, keep guys, uh, you know, been here several years, not at, suddenly at minimum wage. Uh, it's one of the main points there. Um, this budget uh, in turf care we have for full-time uh, staff they're employed year-round. That's 5.5 FTEs reflected in this budget, and two FTEs of seasonal uh, work or seasonal um, full-time equivalents budgeted, uh, of course, without benefits for the year, which are split into four positions: two eight-month and two four-month seasonal. Uh, let's see here. Uh, you know, looking at, uh, you know, if you go through, as you've looked through the line, uh, the GL codes, 
obviously salaries and wages um, is a majority of the increase, um, the $27,000 increase uh, for next year, 24 of that is increases to salaries uh, and wages, uh, GLs. Um, the rest of the increase in budget uh, for next year basically, basically comes down to supply costs, uh, sand, uh, fuel is always a challenging one to predict, but we obviously use a bit of fuel in our maintenance activities and uh, fertilizer, seed, things of that nature, uh, parts, costs for uh, for our repairs, golf, the golf carts, the mowing equipment. Uh, all the tractors and whatnot. So there's uh, forecast to be a little bit more of an increase due to raw material costs there, and steel and whatnot. So it's pretty pretty simple budget. Not looking at a lot of uh, GL increases that aren't directly tied to supply costs. We're not looking to do more next year. Uh, in some cases, we're looking to do a little bit less um, through some irrigation uh, renovation work that we're going to. Uh, be working on this year and next year. Hopefully we'll be spending a little bit less in our uh, parts and repairs for our irrigation system. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, so that was like an 11% uh, increase in parts and repair. Uh, yeah, just in, it, that's not the labor cost, but just in the parts and repair. Uh, So, any questions on those uh, on that first part of budget for Jerker? Um, I'm just looking at the the number, the increase down here between uh, 2019 and 20, mm -hmm. and uh, almost the entire amount is due to salary increases. There are no new employees, right? Uh, that is correct. Yes, there are no new um, hours budgeted for 2020 versus 2019. Sure. And, uh, and as Brian spoke to a bit, um, and we'll get to here in a moment, we um, every year work on it uh, quite a bit, but we work in such a way that we optimize our hours based on the outcome of revenue. What, what are the hours going to get us? So, you know, during snow events and bad days, you know, we continually work to be flexible with our crews to try and uh, reduce our expenditures when when there's not a lot of revenue to gain. Uh, there's a lot of products we have to do in the winter. They're a lot more efficient in the winter, but uh, or in the in the kind of the shoulder seasons in the winter. But uh, we've, you know, in the last 12 months, a couple of years, really uh, pushed hard to optimize uh, the lowest level of uh, hours needed to con complete our tasks to meet our revenue goals. Sarah. Um, my question is on payroll and benefits. Um, I'm assuming you're facing the same issues with wage compression and the minimum wage drastic increase. Um, but what I'm confused by is why there's such a drastic difference between the increase in wages in golf management versus turf care. It's like half at turf care compared to what it's going up in golf management. and. Dollar-wise is one thing because it's different FTEs, but percentage-wise, I would expect it to be more consistent. So, is there, your question is why is our increase lower than the, the golf management increase? Right. Is that correct? Yeah. So, I mean, we just physically have less bodies, um, you, you know, that are employed. Um, you know, our mechanic, um, myself, and several others. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what it would Can you repeat that so that we can hear it? We can't hear Oh, sorry. It. No so microphone. Brian stated more of his uh, staff are at uh, minimum wage or then would be below in 2020 than compared to the turf care staff, uh, which I would agree with. I, uh, yeah. I, b I believe that's the, the answer you're seeing there, or answer to the question you're seeing there. Um, that was all the questions I've heard. So, and as far as, you know, we've worked, um, 
you know, last, it, it's a continual process to try and run as lean as possible to uh, make the most favorable outcome for Sutton Valley. But over the last eight years, we've worked on many of these things, but with our continued work to reduce fertilizer usage levels and be extremely accurate and timely with those, we're um, seeing, I have about a 12% reduction in the last, uh, uh, over 2018. Um, you know, we try and bring back as many seasonal staff as we can uh, to reduce our, our training hours or mo most efficient. Obviously, there's a lot of turnover, I believe. Uh, yeah, I think I, ha you know, in this last, uh, this year we've had, in the last 12 months, we've, I've had seven hires, uh, and four of those would be the seasonal, but actually two of those came back. So, you know, quite a bit of turnover just due to it being lower end of uh, the labor market. Um, we, in the last uh, 12 months, we switched from um, a launder uniform that we rented to a purchase uniform, similar, we did that also in maintenance and, and uh, the crew members uh, launder their own uniforms, so that's a reduction in cost. Um, one of our capital purchases this year was a hybrid mower, so uh, similar to like a Toyota Prius setup, um, uses uh, a percentage less fuel every time you use it. So. Um, we look to make changes there that affect our operating costs, in that case, uh, fuel. Um, we finally completed uh, conversion to all LED lighting. Uh, that was a little over 12 months ago. Um, you know, the maintenance connection software we use in uh, maintenance uh, facilities and turf care um, has allowed some increased um, efficiencies in notifying uh, our mechanic for Sudden Valley, which is shared between maintaining our, our fleet of vehicles and maintenance equipment, turf care and parks equipment. Um, there's been some efficiencies gained there. Uh, like I said, trying to reduce hours when we can during uh, periods of the winter. Questions? Okay, hearing nothing, thank you. All I have in this, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> At this time, I'll bring up uh, Bruce Bishop with maintenance. Page number twenty-seven. Okay. Backwards. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to go through the maintenance budget uh, spreadsheets, page 27 and 28. During that time, I'd like to skip payroll and benefits until the very end. And I think that's going to be the most top one. So I've got basically eight subjects to address. If you have a, any questions about the others, let me know. On page 27, we've got item 6408 as a GL code. Uh, that Jake has already addressed. We've canceled the service, and we've purchased now the clothing for the uh, employees. Okay. Five old, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, pardon me. Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you pull that just a little bit closer? It's yeah, it's really yeah. low. We're driving okay. trouble here. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that better? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Remind me if, <clears throat> if it gets away again. Okay, so um, on page 27, item 5300, we'll come back to you. Page 28, 6610, uh, that increase is mostly for traffic signage and re replace uh, missing signage throughout the valley. Uh, there's a lot of areas that we actually don't have stop signs and such that need to be replaced. Okay, page 28, B6795. That's to purchase uh, repair materials uh, for tasks we performed by the additional uh, FTE that we're asking for. Uh, page 28, 
5085 is rental equipment. Uh, that's to rebuild the Area Z road, reclose, relocate our clean green area, and to create out some of uh, Gate 5's winter overflow parking, uh, like a dozer or a grader, is what we're going to be running. 6404 on page 28 is replacement of two VHF radios. We really depend on those for communications throughout maintenance department. Okay, you want to go back to page 27, and uh, we'll take a look now at the staffing. And I'm going to try to use Jennifer's computer here. Okay, she's going to let me try this. Oh, you're doing great. Can you grab that? See how I stumble through this one. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is some of the things that, <clears throat> that I put together to kind of uh, show you what our workload is in maintenance. And the first thing is our maintenance planning. Uh, get this. Come on. Yeah, I can't do that, Jennifer. I'm sorry. It's just me. So I want to get the. I'm sorry, say again? Do we have these in our book? No. Have a of things no, I think I kind of overloaded you with a lot of information. Oh, okay. Okay. So I was trying to keep the paperwork down and go this way. Ah, there you go. Okay. So what I've done here is take a look at the top part. This is what we have right now. Actuality, uh, we say that we've got four full-time employees. Really, we've got 2.5. The remaining 1.5 work vegetation cold during the summer, our busiest time of the year. That leaves one person in maintenance to do what we call corrective work orders. We don't do PMs. We don't have the staff to do that. So this, this kind of gives you an idea. O represents the operations. Uh, v represents veg control. And then in April, you'll notice we have Firewise, and uh, the staff is totally dedicated to that. We also use Firewise to do training on our veg control new staff. So we, they, they really get into safety, traffic control, team coordination, which really helps us again then when we go through the next five months. Okay? Uh, let's see now. This, uh, go to the, uh, if you can help me. Mm -hmm. I'd like to go to the uh, 2020 routine work order plan. You're good at this, Sarcha. Uh, that'll be on the jump drive. Oh, it's on your jump drive? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Gotta go back. Okay, go over to buildings, if you would. Uh, this is a spreadsheet that you was in your handouts. It shows actually the tasks that are done in the various areas of maintenance. We've got buildings, marina, gate entrances, mailboxes. What I wanted to show you here is the hours that you're seeing up there. Uh, okay, page 54, Jennifer's pointed out. 54. At page 54? Page 54. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the hours that we put in here, I'll start off with the top one, moving D from a roof, debris from a roof, hit the clubhouse. Um, you see the staff hours, our staff, that's two people, it takes three hours to do that. We're a total of six hours for that task. In those six hours, there's everything from the prep, that's getting a vehicle checked out in the morning, doing safety checks on the equipment you're gonna use, the travel time. We have safety briefings on almost every job we do. So when you look at the six hours, that's just not six hours on the roof blowing it off. That's everything included. So it's, I know maybe some of you might question the large hours. Bucket truck, when we use that, for example, up on the gutters, 
that'll take about a half hour alone for one person just to get ready. And if this takes two people, the other person's probably getting a backpack blower checked out, something of that sort. So when you see those hours, they're not inflated. Okay. Okay. So any questions about the spreadsheet that you've had a chance to look at? Okay. Um, Carol. Carol. Oh. Yes. Bruce, I think it would help us if you could um, explain to us, with the people you have right now, um, this 231 and a half hours is what you'd like to get done but can't? Is, is that what I'm hearing, or is that what you are getting done? Uh, I'm looking real quick. Okay, 231? Yeah. That's the total number of task hours if you added up each one of those individual tasks. Mm -hmm. it, it just means the total hours for each one of the tasks. Mm -hmm. it, uh, if you take that, again, the first one, you see six hours, mm -hmm. you'd multiply that times four because it's done four times a year. That then, uh, Jennifer, can we go far right? That then, if you saw the 500, right under the 547, if you multiply that out, of course, you're going to come out with 24 hours total for that task throughout the year. Does that answer? Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, no, all of this is um, preventive maintenance. Routine and preventive maintenance, Re correct. Repair maintenance. Okay, this has no, uh, and then you have additional to that, corrective maintenance for things that go wrong. We'll, we'll address that in a minute. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. thank you. Again, I want to point out that 99% of this we don't have the staff to do. So, okay. Uh, now we'll go to corrective work orders. And Jennifer, can we get logged in to this connection? My email address. I'm not going to let everybody know my password. I know that we've uh, dedicated some money, I should say a significant amount of money and time into the work order system. I'm going to try to show you some of the fruits of what we've got. So <clears throat> what you're looking at right now is the uh, main page when you log in. Jacob and I use this, so I'm going to try to go down works easier with my mouse. What I'm doing right now is selecting just the Sudden Valley maintenance work orders. You can see over here, the highlighted ones are PM work orders. They have not been assigned. And I'm just gonna click through this real quick. You see them popping up. And I'll just pick one of these out so that we can kind of look at it. So this one was supposed to have been targeted for 522. It's, it's not been done, it won't be done. I want to make sure you understand that even though we have the CERT work order system, we do have preventive maintenance on there. We, we don't have the staff to use it on that, those items. Okay. Uh, Let's, there we go. Okay, didn't mean to do that. We'll go back. Okay, so for myself, what we do for corrective work orders, um, Ashley uh, actually created a report for me so I can look at what corrective work orders I need to work on. And this is the report that we have. Mind you, uh, pretty much every morning or evening, I go into this report and look at it. 
big thing on this is a pie chart. That's one person assignment. That's approximately 450 hours for one person. Okay. The others that you're seeing up there, the, the red, the purple, uh, those staff are on veg control. Rather than have them wiped completely out, I kept a couple work orders assigned to them just so I don't lose them. Okay. So here's what a work order report looks like. That's the number, that's the description. That's the person it's assigned to here. And that's the date it was assigned, essentially it was uh, initiated. Our big person down here is uh, Keith. He's our single person that's assigned. I'm still trying to get down through all of these. And you see right here, right now, as of today, he's got 442 hours assigned to him. Stop and think. 173 hours is one person for a month. So you can see that, again, we're not accomplishing anything on our, our corrective work orders. I call it we're doing maintenance by, uh, well, I'll call it crisis. That's, that's the best way to put it. Okay. Um, good. Come on. There it comes. This is what a work order looks like specifically. This is one that uh, Maddie created. On the uh, corrected work order, she can type in the description up here. Uh, we go ahead and assign it. Of course, it comes in maintenance. This tells what building it's in or what location it's in the building. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. I, I don't think you need training on it, but I want you to see what it, detail we can get. I then, when I receive this, I review it. Most of the time I need to go out in the job and look at it, get an idea how many hours it's going to take material, and I try to order that material. If not, then the technician will order it and we'll get it. Okay, so, and of course, again, I sign it then to a technician. Okay, um, without getting a a lot more into the weeds here. Any questions on the work order system? Yes, go ahead, Carol. Go ahead. So, if I understand this correctly, is it Keith is approximately three to four months worth of work backlogged for him currently? Correct. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question I wanted you to address or a situation is that you only have one person. Yes. Right now, because capital work that's being done on ditches and, and trees and so forth. Yeah. Is that accurate? Actually, what, what we did a couple of years ago in order to maintain staff, we moved them into capital work. Mm -hmm. uh, when they're on capital work, like veg control, I can't use those hours on an uh, operational project. And Jennifer, if you want, can explain more details on why. It no, I just, that's, that's not the issue. I, I think most of us know that you have a lot of people from your maintenance staff who are working on those capital projects during the summer months. Correct. So right now you only have, if I recall correctly, one person who's available to do the corrective maintenance and the preventive maintenance. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. And the concern I have that I... I asked you about before was how many of these projects can't he do because he's only one person and from a safety standpoint you can't it can't be done with one person for instance a bucket truck right. or on the roof blowing leaves off leaves and yeah, I, leaves. how do you manage that sort of situation it doesn't get done or I have to take a crew off the veg control now, let me talk a little bit about vegetation control of capital. We have seven people total. Three of the operations people are moved to fetch control, and then we hire another four during the summer. If I lose more than two people off of vegetation control, I then have to start looking for other work that they can do. If I lose four people off there, I either send everybody home or move everybody over to maintenance. At that point, we go over budget and operations. And we do that a couple of times, especially in emergencies. Does that help? Thank you. Okay. Okay, so with that said and all the work that I'm talking about, 
Here's what we really need to have in the maintenance department to maintain the maintenance of Sudden Valley. Uh, back in 2008, when I came here, we had eight people in maintenance. Over the years, budgeting reasons, uh, it's been reduced now down to where essentially two and a half full-time employees. So average, we need seven people. I realize that's not even viable to ask for at this point in time. It, it can't happen. But what I would like to try to do is at least wise get into some of the safety issues, and if I can get this maintenance. I'd like to get into some of the safety issues on the roads, and I'd like to get start doing some of the PMs, ah, there we go, that we could um, do. And keep our buildings and the safety equipment inside the buildings operational. An example, I'm not trying to scare anybody, the lights out went out right now. The only light you have is the window over there. That's it. That's it. The safety lights around here, I can't guarantee they'll come in. Come on. If you're down in the exercise room, it's dark, night. I can't guarantee those lights will come on because we can't do the PM to check them. We don't have the persons, personnel to do it. Again, just trying to emphasize how important it is to me, and I hope to the board, of what we're trying to do today. So, uh, the Finance Committee recommended that we go with one full-time employee. That employee will, employee will work on both corrective work orders and PMs, along with the top one up there that's working corrective work orders and PMs. This is where we get the two people you talked about, Carol, on safety. They can either work together or separately. But what I'm asking beyond what the uh, Finance Committee agreed to is taking one of our current full-time employees, moving them off the veg control that we pay for them on, and put him into operations for five months. That's roughly $22,000 for the year in the maintenance budget change. And I think, Carol, you said that's around three cents? Three cents per thousand. Three cents, three cents per thousand. So, uh, what we can do with that person, though, now is so we can get out and start taking care of the potholes. We can mow the side of the roads. We can put up those safety signs that are missing, the stop signs. We can start to make Sudden Valley's roads safe. That's what that one person can help do. He also helps vacation uh, for the other two full-time employees. Okay, so that's, that's my pitch for you is to add not only the one that the Finance Committee asked for, but one other person that can go out there and start maintaining our roads. Okay. I think I'll stop right there and ask if there's any questions. Larry. Yes, thanks. Uh, you mentioned that if you got this person, they'd be able to deal with safety signs on the roads. Could you explain what you mean by that? Sure. Are you adding new signs? Are you cleaning old signs? What's going on? Yeah. Uh, not adding any new signs. Right now, roughly, we've got eight stop signs that are missing. Uh, again, I don't have staff to go out there and do that. Um, not can't, I can't keep and use that as an excuse, but we just don't have the people. I have the stop signs. I have the posts. I just don't have the people. Um, does that kind of help on the, on the signs part? So you're not talking about cleaning street signs, cleaning stop signs. You're just talking about making sure that the ones that fall down or get hit. Are Those would be the top priorities, yes. Uh, we've got faded signs, one-way signs, or do, it, do not enter signs, I'm sorry. You can't hardly read them. And we do have replacement signs. They just need people to go out and bolt them onto the post. Okay, so some of the dirty signs actually need replacing. Yes. And that is included in what you're talking about. Correct. Okay. And then the last thing, I'll approach the dirty signs. Yes, we'd be doing that too, but that would be fill-in work. It's not as important as the safety of, of uh, work on the work. Thanks. Okay. Paul. I have two questions. Sure. Um, the first one um, kind of goes back to the safety again. Okay. How are you determining, um, I mean, there's so much to do, 
some of the things are easy, some of them are, are more difficult, obviously. Is, are you tracking uh, safety priorities and how are you, how are you doing that? It seems like the, the missing stop signs would be really big and how is that prioritized underneath or over something else? Sure. Um, prioritizing, and I told the finance committee this kind of jokingly, but I really mean it. My last name is Bishop. I told you I look at these things in the morning and evening. I play God. And that's it. I look at the jobs. I look at that list of corrective work orders. I go down through them and try to figure out what one person can do. If it, one person can't do it and it's going to cause human safety or equipment safety, I'll pull somebody off edge control, add them to the operations and move foot. All right, thank you. Um, and then the next question is, I believe that the packet that we have is as the finance committee recommended. Correct. Um, can you show us what that would look like if we were, and this is kind of for Jennifer, to, can you show us what, how that would change if we were to um, give you that extra 20000 for that person? So the original budget as presented tonight on page uh, 52 of your packet, it lists out a maintenance person and then two six-month seasonal positions. Uh, so that's each of those six-month seasonal positions is $26,702, which is approximately 79 cents a month. Uh, so I assume also that there would be some supplies that would go along with the five-month salary. Correct. So maybe it'd be a little more than twenty-two thousand. I, I would say closer to twenty-eight. Yeah, because this six-month seasonal is twenty-six thousand seven hundred and two, and that's for six months instead of five months. Correct. Yeah. So it'd be approximately seventy-nine cents a month, a little less. And that would give you essentially that second person. Yes. Thank you. Here. Here. How much of this uh, maintenance, preventive maintenance backlog is safety related? Is that what this one person that we're talking about would be able yeah. to? Uh, I, I couldn't give you the exact numbers. Uh, I'll, I'll take a shot and say it's at least a quarter to a third. Things like looking at the fire extinguishers on a monthly basis, checking uh, when you talk about safety related. I'm talking about building the interior safety. Yeah. And so that is my next question. Exactly what, what is the, uh, the litmus test of safety-related item? For example, I know vegetation control can be considered a safety-related item. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been in management over 38 years. So I guess what is termed as safety-related, I look at if it wasn't available and it was needed, what's the outcome to somebody? Like you say, if the lights go out in here, I don't think it's, it's really a top safety item. If it's dark and somebody panics, absolutely. They're gonna run around screaming. It's, it's a safety related item to them. So for example, fire extinguisher monthly checks. Would that be a safety related? Yes, yes, definitely. And are we accomplishing that now? No. Well, it's on our PM. It's on our right. work. Would this, uh, would this one person then, would that be at the level that this one person would be achieving that? Right? Absolutely. Yes. If you go back and look at the yellow highlighted, uh, you can't go back, but look in your minds on the corrective work order list that I was showing you. All those yellow items is going to be the priority for the, that, I'll call it, third uh, person. Those are the things that you'll be doing. How many of these safety-related items are we actually mandated to accomplish or are we are getting troubled by the fire marshal or something? Yeah. Good question. Um, again, I'll go back and you said how many. Okay. I, I, yeah. That, again, every one of those highlighted yellow items, uh, that like the exit lights and the safety lights, uh, fire extinguishers, that's a mandated item. And ADA equipment? Uh, ADA is not mandated, but if we have it, 
Yes, we're supposed to be checking it. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Madam President, Sarah. Hi, I have a couple questions. I think they're probably more Jennifer questions. Um, on payroll and benefits, I'm wondering, uh, page 27 or 13, 36. Um, Salaries went up 6.22%, but taxes went down 0.86%. Actually, our payroll taxes have gone down year over year for the last uh, several years uh, due to how we file our workers' compensation claims, and Lisa will be able to speak more to that. Uh, but the so the budgeted rate in 2019 uh, was for an increase in our payroll taxes, but we actually experienced a decrease in our taxes. And maintenance has the highest payroll tax rate of, uh, of any department. So the, the change year over year is um, not as much as we thought it would be. So like other departments that have gone way up in payroll taxes, that's based on the projection from 19, how accurate it was, is basically what it comes down to, is mm -hmm. what that projection is. Yeah, was. Okay. yeah. Correct. correct. And then, so on that page 27, I see the 50,671, and then I see that on the page 52 spreadsheet for the 1FT maintenance, but then on page 28 is the 10,994 supplies, maintenance, one FTE, but I see the two seasonal, but neither one of those are this 10,000 number. What is this number? I can't, I'm not following it through, I guess. Great, so if you go to page 52 of your packet, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see that the, the Finance Committee just recommended the one additional FTE, and so in, uh, there's a subtotal for maintenance department, additional supplies in the first column, and it's $10,994. And it says that that's budget 6795.01. And so that's where that supplies comes from. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. okay. And, and then okay. the salaries as and well. And then follow it down the uh -huh. corresponding salaries. Okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Hearing none. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Next, we'll bring uh, Jacob back up for facilities. What page are we on here? Page 19. Page 19. All right, good evening. I'm back for the facilities portion of this, uh, of the budget uh, presentation here. Uh, obviously ties into buildings and uh, facilities. I guess that's a, you guys all know uh, what we're talking about there. Obviously similar uh, increases in uh, salaries with paid for in facilities is our janitorial support and we use, uh, as some of you may know, but we have one janitor to cover our, uh, all our cleaning needs in uh, Sudden Valley properties, whether it be the restaurant, pro shop, uh, bathrooms, AMPM, marina, et cetera. Um, so the, there was some recommended changes in staffing to try and cover that on a tw uh, seven day a week schedule currently uh, it, it's a challenge. We, we don't keep up with the cleaning needs, um, especially as we uh, push forward trying to, you know, promote use of our facilities more and more. Um, there were some changes, obviously, in rec, but those are accommodated in that budget, and Maddie will speak to that, uh, that we went over in the Finance Committee meeting. Uh, and then um, some uh, materials cost, again, going up. There's, this is, you know, added, um, I guess you can look at it as added scope. We're looking to do more uh, work uh, in, in the janitorial, um, uh, yeah, janitorially in facilities uh, for 2020. So there's an increase there. Um, and then there's a corresponding increase to supplies and whatnot for added uh, labor. 
think that it, whatever. Uh, so, is there any questions uh, as far as uh, the facilities budget for 2020? Sarah, how many FTE are in this one? So, so uh, currently, well, correct the word I should go. So, part of my, um, I believe we're at just under two in uh, facilities, correct? 1.12. Sawn page 40. Uh, 51 of your packet. And we're not projecting any more staff for 2020 in this department? Correct, or? That's correct. So the 14.22% salary increase for one, not even two FTEs? I think I've got a, I've got a wrong PDF. Uh, yeah, that's the number. Um, the salary increase um, from minimum wage now to uh, the new minimum wage is 12.5 automatically. I mean, right. so if you're if you've got someone who's yeah. depends on where they are, but it could easily be a percent or two over that if you're moving them up for. Yeah, and our janitorial staff is, a staff member is very close to that level, uh, similar to turf care and, and uh, golf. Sure. So I guess, Jacob, because these are both yours, so I guess, I'm just really confused by the inconsistencies in salary increases, like turf care is only going up 8%, which is less than the $1.50 increase, <laughs> percentage-wise, but this one that only has a couple people is going up a higher percentage. It just seems like we're not Right, consistent. well, it, it all depends on if, if your staff is at currently at minimum wage or, or slightly above or you know it just depends on how far they are above at some point you have to you make a decision as far as um, obviously if they're below minimum wage for next year you have to raise them to minimum wage if they've been with us a period of years there's a hope that they wouldn't be making suddenly minimum wage after being with us a couple of years so each it, it literally goes down to the to each position in a department how that decision is made, what we're going to look at uh, for an increase. So it, it just all depends on the number of staff that are right at minimum wage or just above, or maybe they're, you know, you may have somebody who makes 16 an hour this year and they're probably going to make 16 an hour next year because they're, maybe they're just outside that wage compression gap and you have to draw the line somewhere. Each department manager works with Jennifer and kind of decides where that is. Uh, so yeah, there is variability there because each person makes a differing amount based on their job. Uh, so uh, other than putting them all up and going going through at the wage uh, at the at the individual level, uh, that's that's the uh, difference is just proximity to minimum wage. You know, if you're making two dollars an hour over, and then suddenly you're uh, making 50 cents over there, there's a bigger adjustment than if you're, you know, still $2 an hour over minimum wage. And the goal there, in, you know, in uh, janitorial, it's very hard to find janitorial staff. We traditionally have a very challenging time replacing that, which then causes uh, a staff to backfill that position through maybe maintenance personnel or, um, I mean, the times we've hired services or used uh, labor-ready type of outfit, and then the cost is even 
is multiplied due to their overhead rates. Actually, in 2015, we had outsourced our janitorial, and you'll see that $62,828, it's on page 20, line 7095. That's just, that's almost, almost all janitorial cost. That was outsourced. Outsourced. It's very expensive to outsource janitorial. And then on the utilities, it looks like budget on budget were going down dramatically, but it looks like that was just over budgeted for 19 because the actuals, it looks pretty in line with the actuals. Is that accurate? That's accurate. Madam President Paula. Uh, yeah, Paula. So, so what I'm kind of taking away, and maybe this is for you, Jennifer, that um, if what I'm hearing is right. Are you saying that outside of wage, wage compression, for the most part, you're expecting salaries to stay stagnant in 2020? Um, I mean, that, that's kind of what I'm hearing. It with If that's the, the reason for the big fluctuation um, is like if other people are kind of up higher, that we're not expecting to see big changes and fluctuations in salary outside of wage compression. Is that... I mean, I think some positions are still below market, and so there's some some of that taken into account as well um, to bring other positions in line with with uh, current market expectations. So, are there other items driving that, the the big that change? That I mean, in particular, in facilities, the janitor is one of the lowest paid positions. And so, you know, he's been here for quite a while. We'd, we'd like to retain him. He does a great job. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, most of that, a portion, or most of that is, is for wage compression to be able to keep him here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and I think Lisa spoke to it before. I mean, she does salary surveys with some regularity. Uh, and we look at, you know, what it costs in the county, in the city, to try and minimize the amount of turnover we have because the turnover then requires more training and reduced efficiencies. And if you really want to maximize your budget dollars every year, you have to look at that. And, and it is a tough economy to, to retain people right now. So um, she does a great job with each year for budgeting purposes, letting us know where we're at so that we can try and keep good staff here versus losing that, you know, losing that person to a higher paid job, you know, in the county somewhere else, which which I will be very honest happens quite a bit on my side of things from golf. Mm -hmm. um, no, co turnover is costly. <laughs> Andrew, it, 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 it is costly and it can be detrimental to a, a property from a uh, psychologically. It can be also a little bit damaging as well. But uh, yeah, mostly just training and training turnover costs. Yeah. Andrew, yeah, you may have already answered this, you know, off the bandwagon of retention. And experience what what's the reason for the decrease in medical benefits for this department medical benefits um, I was there was an error in 2019 and I over budgeted in this department the um, part of the time is split with another department and then so all the benefits were in that department and a little bit in the other so the decrease is not due to a change in benefits it's due to a correction of the 2019 budget so medical benefits in 2019 in this department will come in less than what is budgeted so the impact of the employee is not a decrease in their overall medical benefits? No, no change in medical benefits, though we do anticipate a 15% increase, and that's been accounted for in the 2020 number, but it was an error in the budget in 2019. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you again. Marina. Marina. I'll do Marina. Uh, that is on page 29. One of the big things that you will notice uh, will be the increase in revenues. Um, the marina has not had any significant increase in the last 10 years to the wet or dry slips. Uh, we are proposing a 10% increase on that. Uh, just to give everybody a little bit of history, uh, Blaine and Bellingham, uh, their marinas, for an example, a 20-foot boat moored there from April 1st to October 31st will cost $2,745. Uh, 
Um, a 38 foot boat parked at Anacortes is $450 a month to, to moor in. Uh, our current rates, if you look up there, uh, there are combinations. Uh, the, just a single slip, select slip, uh, you're looking at $980. There's different, different slips that, that are wet uh, where they are in the, the marina. Uh, you do have a wet dry uh, where you could uh, have a couple boats and that right there for the select one is 1140, 1000, 890 and 400 just for the annual dry. Um, it is something that uh, we are one of the we are the only public launch area here uh, and we do allow outside numbers to moor in. To the marina so um, and there's also a at least a six-year wait to get a wet slip at our marina at this current time question about the uh, the, the wait list do members have priority on the wait list I, I, I cannot answer that for you right now uh, but there is a six-year wait list I will get that answer for you though yes. members have priority yes. members have priority thank you thank you Andrew? Andrew, is there a foot, you know, a boat foot limit that our marina can hold? What's the, what's the capacity? Uh, we have, uh, I want to say, 66, 66 wets, and uh, right around, I believe, 185 to 100 dries. I'll get, I'll have that exact number. What, well, I guess, what about how? Is there how large of a boat can you fit in the slips? That I, I don't know. I can't. Okay. That was 26 feet, depending on the swim platform. Thank you. So, last question that is on the wait list is there a need for larger boat slips? I think we need more boat slips, but unfortunately, we can't put them in there. We are limited on what we can put in due to regulation. <laughs> So it sounds like we haven't evaluated whether there's a need for larger slips or if the... There, there's no, you can't put any bigger slips in there. There's just not the room in there to put any more in. So we can't put a larger a larger boat in there if that's what you're looking for. Well, I guess what I'm getting at is, I mean, if there's a need, right, and we have a product offering, we can limit the smaller slips and increase the size and drive more revenue. Well, it, the, the, different si the different slips are where they're located in the marina. You have insides and you have outsides. So, if you've ever looked at the marina, I can't put any more slips in there because I don't have the room due to the due to the the spit on both sides. So, I there's no more extra space to put docks in. Is where where the issue comes. Uh, the different pricing comes from where they are in the actual marina itself. So. Great. Okay. Now I understand that. I okay. guess my question was a little different. But okay. Didn't talk more. Question? <clears throat> if more questions? Carol. Carol, how many of our um, of our slips right now are are members versus public? There is only, I believe, five that are non-members right now. Anybody else? Anybody else? Oh. Um. And looking at the 10% um, increase on that, can you speak to any improvements that have recently either been done to the marina or that are going to be done to the marina given um, that type of an increase? Uh, some of the things that have been done in the past, there is a new standpipe that has been put in, uh, that was put in through capital, as well as new uh, new gates into the, the, the marina itself. Uh, some of the things that we'll be working on uh, next year with the boat masters is increasing the, the cleats, uh, working on trying to replace a couple of the docks that are there that we have in place right now, uh, and working a little bit on the, the gate access arm for the public. That seems to be an ongoing issue with not working when it needs to work. So there will be, we will work with the, the dock masters down there to address their issues uh, that need to be done. So there will be work that will be done down there. Carol. 
I've heard concerns about the location of the canoe racks. What's being done about that, or they, is there anything done? Though those were moved over there when the spit was being worked on, uh, and then they were concreted into the ground. So when they were moved, when they were moved. So uh, Jake has those on the, his to-do list to get moved over there, but it's going to be a little bit. So just not hook them up and slide them over and put them back in. So we have to dig out the posts that have concrete in them. So it, it's, it, it is on his work order to get done, but it will not happen as quickly as we would like. Oh, Larry? Oh, Larry? Excuse me. Uh, is there anything that can be done within the scope of our existing permit and within our budget to improve the uh, parking area and the dry slip area because there has been, a, how should I say, a marked deterioration of those areas over the last many years. I know there is a plan on SURF to go ahead and pave all that. Um, I don't foresee that happening in the near future due to the cost of Macadam. It's very something, something much something less than paper. yeah. Uh, we can work on uh, with Bruce and Jacob to fill in the potholes with uh, modified or gravel. Uh, we really have to be careful again in the watershed what we can and cannot do. Uh, but the only way to really solve the problem is put it under hard, make it a hard surface all the way around, and that's not something that's going to happen for a couple years. Now, does that clearly that applies to the parking area? What about the dry slips? Dry slips, uh, same thing. I'd put them, I'd put everything on a, on a hard slab. So they're basically, they are the way they are. They're gravel right now, yes. Yeah, yeah. okay. The, the only way to really solve that and make that a better marina is to put everything under hard surface. Yes. Lots of money. Lots of money. Okay. I understand at the end of last year that there was permission given by the county or whoever to use a different kind of fill for some of those potholes that might be a little bit longer lasting. Is that uh, something you know about? That is nothing I have heard about. Uh, I can give okay. a producer, Jacob. Yeah, that. I think yeah. a good thing to look at. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think the word was fines. In fines. The, mixed with the gravel yeah. to yes. help keep the gravel in place. Fines are, are, are byproduct of yeah. stone. Yes. Are fine. Are fine. Yep. They're Mm -hmm. Yep, choke. choke. And President Paul. 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 Um, I believe on the um, on the page with the the fees that there are um, non-member um, day fees. Um, did I see that on there? For the one person, two person cards for for the for the access card fees. Do do. Are we able to really monitor that to make sure that we are gaining revenue for for that? And and if not, and I ask that, it's a bit leading, I've heard that that may not be happening. Do we have any way of um, encouraging that so that we see more revenue down there on that? The only way you could get into the non-member is with a gate card. There's, a, there's an actual gate at the end of the marina. Uh, that works with a card you, which you have to come in and get from us in the office, and that will get your gate arm up and down. Now, if the gate arm stays up, which it has done throughout the season and has done for many years from what I've been told, yes, you can come and go as you please. So that is some of the, some of the areas that have to be addressed with mainly the gate arm itself. Okay. And that was one of the items on your list yeah, to we'll, look at? We will work on that and try to get that fixed so that Again, if you don't have a, our access card, you cannot get that gate to go up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Madam President, Andrew. 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 Sorry, last question. Um, is, does this budget account for dredging or set money aside for dredging? You are looking at a 10-year project to, to even begin to dredge for permitting alone. Mm -hmm. So the answer is yes. There is no, no, there is no dredging. To start your process right now is a 10 years to begin to get a permit. I, right, I understand yeah. that. So yeah. there's yeah. nothing at this point in time to go ahead and start any dredging. The right. cost. My question, cost. though, was are we putting money aside in anticipation of dredging? Once permits come through, we need to. We have don't have, you don't even have a permit started. It's a 10 year, so it hasn't been started. Uh, you don't have a permit started yet to go ahead and get it started. So I can't, I can't. It's 10 years. If we decide to, not tomorrow we're going to do it, it's going to be 10 years out. Right, I get, I get that in spades. Well, my question I'm trying to uh, articulate, I guess, better is what are we doing to save dollars so when we do need to dredge, 
in 10 years. We have the funds available and I would believe staff could find uh, an estimate of what that dredge would look like with increases over time at a 10 year horizon if you think that's when it's going to be to account for that. If it's a, let's say a million dollars today, it's gonna be two million in 10 years. We should start accounting for that. So I guess my question is, does this budget start, is this budget putting aside dollars? And I, what I'm hearing is that the answer is no. No, there's nothing put aside. Thank you. Madam President, we have Larry. Uh, yeah, I was just going to point out that, as you noted, uh, the arms, the gate arms have been a problem. Frankly, since Sudden Valley was created, the, the entrance gates used to have arms, and they were continually breaking, which is why they no longer have them. Um, so it's very understandable that they will remain a problem. What what can be done? Have you been able to look into, has there been any technology improvement since the 70s? There is a lot of good technology out there for gates. It comes down to cost. We can put gates in. Uh, the facility I had out east, each gate was $25,000. 25000 to put in the gate. Uh, we will work with Security Solutions and Norm uh, to upgrade what we can in there the best we can so that the issue will not continue. As, you as best we can as with best we can, as best as, we as best as we can, yes. Okay, all right. Actually, just sorry, a point of information on the dredging. Uh, the, the cost of actually dredging the marina is the only item that is not included in the reserve study that will be called out in the ballot materials to the membership to state that we see this as a significant expense in the future and we don't know the cost of it, so it has not been included in the reserve study. What we have done is included uh, about $10,000 in 2024, I mean, $10,000 today, in 2024 to assess the marina for dredging. In 2024. Carol? I was going to respond to that. Jennifer did a good job. There was one other thing I wanted to mention, though, and that is that the only things that we are funding right now and are funded in this budget is what we have in SURF for the A priority items for for uh, 2020 and the B priority items for this year that we could not get done. So we are not future funding anything in capital, um, including dredging. Um, that is one of the things the Finance Committee wants to have the board look at. And it's up to the board whether it's, you know, whoever is on it uh, this year and next needs to put a plan together about just what you're talking about because we are getting behind on those kinds of things and we are not prepared for them. And they're going to end up being assessments if we choose to get them done and very large assessments. We need to start putting money aside now. Yes, uh, I, I understand that at the end of this evening we're going to be getting into the surf and so I don't want to get off onto a surf discussion now but that topic is extremely important to me, and I hope that we do get to it this evening. Um, we're going to go into surf tonight? Yeah, okay. Okay. That's on the agenda. That's the next. I have one more question on uh, the marina. Now, what was it you think? Oh, the, uh, the arm, which has been a problem forever. Is it causing lost revenue? <clears throat> And how much? How much? What's the significance I, yeah, of this? Yeah, uh, it, it, if it's if it's up and you don't have a gate card, I mean anybody can come and go uh, without having somebody stand there and monitor it. Yeah, exactly. How much would it cost to have somebody just standing there watching, as opposed to all right? So if if you are a regular you know season holder, you you really don't need it. You go in and out. You may lose a few dollars from people who are buying daily passes, but. Um, to me, it's a, not a big priority, unless you can show me a large loss that's coming from it. Without somebody standing there uh, eight hours a day, I, I couldn't quantify that for you right now. There's no way on how many people might have snuck in through that gate being open. Yeah. Okay, Sarah? Um, on the landscape R and M, we have seventy five hundred dollars budgeted for the marina for twenty twenty. What is there anything specific planned with that, or what was that for? That's uh, 
any repairs and maintenance that has to be done done yeah. done down there with um, landscaping, which would be parking lots, things of that nature, where it would be extra gravel or you know, stuff like that that we would be using down there. Madam President Carroll. When we're finished with this, could we have a, a break? Oh, um, I wanted to get that in before well, we yeah, jumped okay. to the next. <laughs> Isn't that between Marina and Capitol? Uh, uh, is there anything else on Marina? Uh, nothing on the Marina, uh, but would Jennifer, would you remind me, where is the rental income for the restaurant? For the restaurant? Yeah, I just, I don't recall where that's located. In uh, facilities. 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 Mm -hmm. Thanks. Which we went through. Which we went through. Okay. okay. Anything else? Anything else? Okay, let's see. It is 8.46. Let's take about a 10-minute break, come out back at uh, 8.55.
Two more minutes, Two more please. minutes please.
up.
Thank you.